In the previous lectures, we've talked about the importance of controlling your type 1 error rate. An increasingly popular way to make sure that people adequately control their type 1 error rates is pre-registration, where you specify what you're going to do before you perform the study, and then after when you've collected the data, you can just follow this pre-registered plan to make sure that your type 1 error rate is nicely controlled. Let's talk a little bit about why this is important and how you can pre-register and what you need to take care of when you make a pre-registration. Let's first focus on the importance of pre-registration. Why do we need to do this? Now this is an example where you don't really need to read the fine print here. I'll explain it to you. But this is the first study in an article by Daryl Bem about precognition. And in his experiment, he had 100 participants who performed a sort of reversed priming task. Normally, people have to categorize stimuli by pressing one of two buttons. And this happens, of course, after they've seen the stimulus. But here, this was reversed. So people first made a choice. They pressed one or the other button. And only then did they see the stimulus that they were supposed to respond to. So if they could predict the future, you would expect that they were right more than guessing average. And in this case, we see that there was a situation where a number of different types of stimuli were used. The reported result here, the main result, is their performance on erotic stimuli. But there are a lot of other different types of stimuli that were used where no differences were found. So for example, although the performance was higher than chance on the erotic stimuli, there were no differences on negative stimuli or romantic stimuli. Now if you see this, this sort of makes you wonder, is this really the main prediction that this researcher set out to test? If we look at the p-value, if you do the math and you have a Bonferroni correction, you want to control the type 1 error rate for all the possible combinations, then this would actually not be statistically significant if we would have controlled our error rate for all possible comparisons. So you see that it's very important to specify which tests you're really interested in before you do the analysis to make sure that other people who read your article are also convinced that your results and your findings are credible. Now here we see that there's a wide range of options of how to analyze your data, ranging from very exploratory analysis. You just look at your data and anything that happens to stand out you consider as an informative result to a situation where you slightly torture your data. You don't really look at everything that's possible, but you have one hypothesis, but you look at it from this side or from that side. To a situation where research is purely conformatory. You specify what you want to do, you perform the experiment, and you analyze the data. So this is from a research article by Wagemakers and colleagues where they argue for the necessity of having a purely conformatory research agenda. We can see examples in the scientific literature for where this would make sense. For example, in a paper about p-curve analysis, a topic we'll come back to later, Simonson and colleagues analyzed a set of studies from the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology where the researchers reported results only with a covariate. So you can do a covariate analysis and it might really answer the question that you are asking. But what we also know is that people are sometimes using a covariate as a flexible way to look at their data from a different perspective with the goal to reduce the level of the p-value. So their initial analysis might not show a statistically significant effect, but then they play around with their data just a little bit until adding a covariate would make a statistical analysis significant. So when they look at set of studies that use covariates, they see that the p-curve analysis shows that these studies actually lack evidential value. So using this flexibility leads to a set of studies in the scientific literature that really don't tell us anything about what's likely to be true. So recently, people in psychology have been starting to think about how can we change this type of flexibility? How can we make sure that people actually report the analysis that they set out to do in the beginning? And an increasingly popular solution is the use of registered reports, where people write down their predictions before they perform the data collection, and then they analyze their data just by following these reports. Now, it's very important that this specifies the plan of the analysis of the main hypothesis, of course, it doesn't prevent you from exploring your data. This is perfectly fine, but it just differentiates between pre-registered, conformatory research and more exploratory research. 
So in this way, pre-registration formalizes the type 1 error control. You have a very specific plan that you set out to do, and all the tests that you do that follow your pre-registered hypothesis have a controlled type 1 error rate. For other analysis, more exploratory analysis, you can test anything that you'd like, but in this case your error rate is inflated to an unknown level. So you don't really know the probability that you're making a false positive result. Does this matter? Aren't we making life a lot more complicated by asking researchers to pre-register their hypothesis? Well, there are some data to show that there is indeed a benefit of pre-registering and preventing this flexibility. This is from an analysis of a set of studies that were large randomized controlled trials in medicine, either before it was formally required to pre-register your study, the design and the analysis plan in clinicaltrials.gov, and after this was formally required. So on the left we see that from all the big randomized controlled trials, some don't show any statistically significant result, but many actually do. 17 out of 30 studies before 2000 actually show a significant result. After pre-registration became required, this percentage dropped to only 2 out of 25. Now this is an indication that if we ask people to specify their hypothesis beforehand, they don't always succeed in confirming their hypothesis. Which is totally fine, of course. It's very important to realize that your prediction did not hold up. There might have been new insights in exploratory analyses in these studies done after 2000, but these need to be confirmed, confirmed in follow-up research. So we see that the main goal of pre-registration is distinguishing confirmatory research from exploratory research. This is sometimes called harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. If we think back to the study we described in the beginning about precognition, where a researcher tests all sorts of hypotheses, then after looking at the data, a researcher might think, oh, of course, there's something very special about erotic stimuli that's not present in negative stimuli or in romantic stimuli. And this researcher might come up with a hypothesis of why it's actually very plausible that an effect has occurred. But this is hypothesizing after the results are known. This is creating a hypothesis based on the observed data, and that's reversing the empirical cycle. When you're exploring data, you can perform a hypothesis test, but you can't test a hypothesis. This is a statement by de Groot who already pointed this out in 1950s. The point here is that it's perfectly fine to explore data and look around patterns that you might find. But when you do this, you cannot test whether this hypothesis is actually true, because what you have done, you have actually tested a hypothesis on the same data set that was used to generate it. The alpha level in this case is unknown, and it is inflated to an unknown extent. So you can never be sure whether this is a type 1 error or not, and you can make no statement about the frequency of type 1 errors in the long run, if you are allowing yourself to be so flexible. So when you pre-register your study, what are things that you need to specify? Well, as we've seen, optional stopping is one way in which you can inflate your type 1 error rate. So one thing that you have to do is justify your sample size. Of course, thinking about your sample size before you collect data is also very useful in controlling your type 2 error rate. Thinking about how many people you need will control both these error rates, but it will fix the type 1 error rate to whatever level you've specified. This is sometimes known as the stopping rule. And it can be anything. You can collect data until it starts to rain outside or until the week is over, anything that you want. In a later lecture we'll talk about justifying your sample sizes. Another thing you need to specify is the independent variable and the dependent variable for each test that you want to do. What is it that you're actually going to analyze? What are the conditions in your study and what are the dependent variables with which you measure whatever type of effect you predict? For the dependent variable, it might be relevant to say, I'm using a questionnaire and these are the items that I will average and I'll perform my analysis on this average score. It matters whether you'll do this or maybe use one of all these items. So this flexibility should be prevented by specifying what the DV is. Finally, you should describe your analysis plan. How are you going to analyze your data and which statistical tests do you plan to perform? 
This includes specifying things like the alpha level that you want to use for each test. How are you going to correct for multiple comparisons? Or do you want to use a 5% error rate or a 1% error rate or a 10% error rate? What do you think is sensible? It also requires you to specify things like data cleaning. What is an outlier and how you're going to re remove outliers when they're problematic? Now we see that journals are increasingly starting to use these pre-registered studies. In this example, journal Perspectives on Psychological Science is using pre-registered protocols to perform large-scale replication studies, where a lot of people team up and perform a pre-registered replication of an existing study in the scientific literature. There's a clear benefit of pre-registering your studies, especially when the journal where you're going to submit your research allows for these pre-registered reports. So you can do this for a replication study, but you can also do it for very novel research. This means that based on the plan that you have, you will get comments from experts in the field that tell you how to improve your study design before you have put in all the effort to collect the data, analyze the data and write the report. Compared to the traditional system where you only get all this feedback and these comments after you already did all the work, there's a big benefit because these peer reviews before you collect the data will allow you to improve your study design. So instead of doing all the hard work and then being told by reviewers that you made a mistake or you should have taken into account something that you didn't see, you can get this feedback before you collect the data. So this is a very efficient way to make sure that you perform a well-designed uh, study where your peer reviewers agree that this is indeed the best approach to study a specific topic and that the results will be informative regardless of whether they are statistically significant or not. And this is another very important benefit of these registered reports. When you've submitted your study design for publication, the peer reviewers give you some suggestions to improve the way that you want to study this topic. The editor of the journal will say, as long as you follow this pre-registered design, regardless of the outcome of the study, we will publish it. Now we know that publication bias is a huge problem in the scientific literature. There are way more study results that turn out to be statistically significant, as you would expect. The reason for this is that people don't publish their non-significant findings, or when they are submitted for publication, journals don't accept them. Now this problem is prevented by these registered reports, because people say, if you follow this plan, we will publish the results no matter what the outcome. So this is an important benefit, and if you do a challenging study, it's very worthwhile to consider following these registered report routes. There are some other benefits to pre-registering your studies. For example, you can do less conventional, but more efficient designs. We already discussed how you can improve the statistical power of your test by performing a one-sided test. This also controls the error rate, but you're saying that you have a directional prediction. And if this is the case, then you can be more efficient in designing a well-powered study. However, people always think that there's something wrong with people who report one-sided tests because it's very often used as a way to reduce the p-value. So in this uh, pre-registered report, you can write down that you have a directional prediction, you'll do a one-sided test, and you can uh, reap the benefits of this directional hypothesis. Now, there are some places where you can pre-register your study design. You can visit the Open Science Framework or websites such as aspredicted.org. And you can see what's required for you to pre-register your study, which information you need to fill out. Now, if you do this, you can keep this pre-registration private, so you don't need to publish it online so that everybody can see what you do. It is possible, but you can just keep it private until the moment that you're going to submit your results for publication. And you can say, look, these are the results that I'm presenting, and you can see that this is exactly what I predicted when I designed the study. So in this lecture, we've seen that pre-registration is a novel but very useful solution to distinguish exploratory research from confirmatory research. And in doing so, it allows you to adequately control your type 1 error rates.